Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it would mean a lot if you could rate, subscribe, review wherever you're watching or listening to it. I'll take the glass off because I got a weird go there. Anyway, today I am happy to have on for, I believe it is the fourth time, third time talking Burford, fourth time overall, my friend Arden Fogan. Arden, how's it going? Hi, Andrew. Nice to be back. You are right, 100%. It's fourth time and three out of four is about Burford. Well, it's been a great call. It's uh. Well, we'll get there. Let's start with the disclaimer. Remind everyone, nothing on this podcast is financial advice. That's always true, maybe particularly true today because neither Artem or I are lawyers and we're going to be talking about a company that is completely about legal and litigation and all that type of stuff. So uh, please remember, please do your own work, consult a financial advisor, all that type of stuff. Artem, we're coming on today because, you know, last week, We've taught this is our third podcast on Burford. Last week, Burford got the final, final judgment, right? Final judgment rule that they won. They won the Peterson case about a month ago or a couple of weeks ago. We got the preliminary ruling that said, Hey, Burford, you're winning, uh, full interest, full damages, all that sort of stuff. And we wanted to do an update on Burford now that YPF they can start collecting the claims. And then I think we also wanted to do a update on maybe, you know, a little bit more of the fundamental business value, the core business value here. So uh, I'm going to toss it over to you in one second. Uh, before I do, I will just remind everyone, Arden and I have done two previous podcasts on Burford. And if you go back and listen to the second one we did, that was in April, that was right after the judge gave her summary judgment ruling that said, Burford, we're going to win. We just need to go determine damages and interest rates. If you go listen to that, that holds up the very, very well. And we'll cover a lot of the questions that we'll probably discuss here anyway, because Artem, I like to chat, but a lot of the questions we were kind of getting from other people. So if there's a question we don't address, or you want to dive in deeper, go look at that or go look at the blog. I've got tons of writing on Burford on the blog. So I'll just remind people of that. But Burford, uh, Artem, here we sit. It is mid-September 2023. We've got the final ruling. How are you looking at Burford these days? Uh, okay. So before I answer that question, uh, I need to say two things. Number one, I need to give my disclaimer, which is Karakan Capital LLC and its related entities and related parties are long, Burford, broadly defined, meaning regardless of the particular instrument. So that's number one. Then there is a second, uh, display, uh, in second, which is not really disclaimer. And obviously, this is not investment advice. We own shares, we may own other instruments, etc., including bonds. So not investment advice. That's number one. Number two, you said that none of us are, is law is a lawyer. So technically, I am a lawyer. Oh, I thought I, you were just inter okay. Go ahead. I, I lied. And technically, I'm still admitted to the practice of law in the state of New York, but I have a status of retired. So I'm retired from the practice of law. Okay, perfect, perfect. So that's a uh, important clarification. You worked so hard, you know. If you're a retired man now, I can't imagine how hard you were working when you were still uh, <laughs> you were, you were on the job. Exactly, exactly. So that's a um, clarification. So and yes, I will echo Andrew's uh, what Andrew said. We did two prior podcasts. Many of those things still remain relevant and true today. The older one, I have longer hair. The more recent one, I have shorter hair. If you need to differentiate between the two. And also, I enjoyed what everything that Andrew wrote on his blog about oh, Burford. Thank you. So I think if you are too tired of listening to people talking and instead you want to read one man writing, go to the blog, reread those posts. And I believe that many of them have been made publicly available. Yeah, yeah, tons of them, including uh, did a lot of expert calls with the people who you know had experience at the Burford expert at the Burford Asset Recovery Place with people that had experience at Burford. So yeah, I, I think they hold up pretty well. I'm a subscriber of your blog, so that's why I don't know which materials are available yep. for everybody, which people or for which materials people need to subscribe. That's why I want to make sure. So they're all there. They're available for free. I think they're great writing, great examples, great Thank analysis. You. Go back, read them. 
So now, uh, where do we stand with Burr for today? So as you said, final, final, final judgment happened on Friday. Today is Wednesday, September 20th. So it happened on Friday, several days ago. So what does final, final actually mean? So let's explain. On March 31st, there was a summary judgment. Yep. It's partially granted. Then there was a trial on July 26, 27, 28, which is ironically 26 and 27 are two days when I took the bar exam in 2005. So I don't know whether they timed it because of that. I don't think so. But it was a funny coincidence. And after the trial, the judge released her ruling. And that ruling asked two parties, Peterson and Argentina and Eaton Park and Argentina, please go sit down. And I already ruled on the date for the tender. And tender date is very important because it would impact the exact amount of damages and how those damages are calculated. And the judge, Loretta Presker, also ruled on the prejudgment interest. And the range was 6 to 8%. She said 8 And she said, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, the math is clear. Two of you go sit down, pull out your HP 12C or Excel or pen and paper, whatever you need, and come up back to me with the proposed order, and I will enter into that order, and that will be the final amount. Uh, surprise, surprise, two parties could not agree. I, if I could the, the, the Argentina proposal, with, the Argentina proposal was so crazy. Like the judge had ruled on all of these things and she said, just come back to me. And the Argentina proposal was like, hey, let's live in a theoretical world where the judge didn't rule on anything and gets some numbers. Like I was reading, I, it was so crazy. I can't believe that they, with a straight face, entered it into the court docket, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I echo uh, many things that you just said. So, and two parties went back to the judge, proposed their orders, and judge said, like, wait a second. It's very nice that you couldn't agree. I need to rule. And on Friday, the judge de issued her final ruling. That's a called final judgment. Yep. Now, Important. Final judgment doesn't actually mean that the legal system stops working. Correct. It will be likely an appeal. Argentina so far indicated that it would likely appeal the, the judgment. And second uh, circuit court will listen that appeal at some point in the future. It's going to take some time. Not going to happen tomorrow. It's probably, we're talking probably about a year, maybe longer. Before they start taking the case, probably. But what is important is this. Once the final judgment becomes final, for the lack of the better word, Burford, and when I say Burford, I mean Peterson, in the Park, yep. and plaintiffs. So I will use those terms interchangeably, even though technically it's inappropriate to say that. Burford could start its collection efforts. So that's very, very important. The, the on, there are only two possibilities where Burford will not be able to start its collection efforts. Possibility number one, Argentina posts a bond that must be obtained from a high quality, typically, typically high quality insurance company that will do that, that line of business that will say, listen, we trust this counterparty. They're incredibly reliable and credit worthy. We love them. So if they don't pay, we will pay effectively. I'm oversimplifying again here. It, it, it's literally like if you follow the movies and somebody goes to jail, it's the bail bondsman, right? Hey, we'll put yeah. up the money. And say you'll go to court, and if you don't go to court, like the money's there, and yeah, that, that's kind of what people can think of when they say yes. an insurance bond. You know, in this case, a Berkshire would have to put it up because it's a big, big bond if they did it. It's, it's most likely going to be a very sizable bond. So Berkshire and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger can obviously do that. If they do that, I would be thrilled. We'll talk my. <laughs> I'm <laughs> laughing because there's no way. It, you, I'll ruin the punchline. There's no way in heck that anyone would put up this bond for Argentina. It's so I, big and there's nobody who trusts it. I think yeah. it's unlikely and given the Argentina's history, it would be probably a very risky endeavor for an insurance company to oppose that bond, which means that I don't think it will happen. And if, it doesn't, and if that doesn't happen, Burford should be able to start collection efforts and enforcement. When I say collection and enforcement, I use them interchangeably. Yep. There can be another possibility. If the court puts a stay on the enforcement. It could happen. It rarely happens. We cannot rule it out completely, but it's fairly unlikely. I would say even very unlikely. It's, and I'll just add, it's very unlikely because in the most 
most of the time when you put a stay, you go to the judge who just ordered that you lost the ruling and you say, hey, we think there are serious errors with your judgment. We want you to put a stay on the collection on your own ruling. And guess what? Judges generally don't like to do that. So again, not impossible. I do think there are places where they could get an emergency stay from a appeals court or something. But generally, you have to go back to the judge who you just lost and say, hey, can you pause collection on your ruling? Guess what? Doesn't tend to fly. Pretty much. Pretty much. And now, adding to your point about Argentina going back uh, to Judge Loretta Prescott and submitting their order, which was quite, in my opinion, divorced from reality, uh, the judge in her final judgment is issued on September 15 put this language, which I think is just terrific language, so we'll read it. Um, the Republic, not satisfied with the extraordinary latitude afforded to it a trial to insert new factual and legal issues, attempts a final ambush by arguing that the court's findings that interest should run from blah, 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 right? So, like, oh, oh, by the way, so I love general legal writing by American judges. Many decisions by Supreme Court, I think it's masterpieces. And I love the writing of Judge Loretta Prescott. So if you, you know, have nothing better to do, you can pull out some of those decisions and, and read them. They you know who it. else loves her writing? Uh, Burford loves their writing because there's, we'll probably talk about when we talk to Corby's, but there's a line where, you know, a lot of plaintiffs, a lot of defendants say, oh, you're getting litigation financing. It's a perversion of the system. And she had that great footnote, which Burford highlighted in their earnings call, where she said, hey, it doesn't matter if Burford's involved or not. Argentina harmed people here. And the fact that Burford is financing, I, people can go read it. People can listen to earnings call. But you are not the only one who loves their writing is all I wanted to say. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not pretending to be original on this yeah. issue. That's for sure. So, and uh, yes, I would definitely encourage. Uh, you and I spoke before that one of potential risks for Burford business model is in general, the regulatory risk. What if someone will come and say, by, by someone we're talking about regulators, and say like, oh, you should not be, uh, legal finance should not be allowed, or it should be heavily regulated, or if you, whatever unnecessary and probably harmful regulations can be passed. So that's always the risk, and we discussed why we think it's not a big risk. And, uh, and there are two ways how those regulations could happen. One way is by the Congress of the United States getting together, passing the law, president signs it and gets into the law, right? And then obviously it will be only federal matters, not state matters, because each state would regulate its own matters. So it's, it's pretty complex in the US because it's a federal state. But another way is if courts and judges start implicitly regulating litigation finance, implicitly again. But we live in the common law country, precedents are important, and that could happen. And I think when, even though we're talking about trial court, which is the lowest level of the judicial system in the US when we talk about at the federal level, but Southern uh, court, federal court for the Southern District of New York is probably one of the most sophisticated parties, uh, courts in the nation, especially when we're talking about finance matters. And uh, Judge Presque is a very well respected judge. And when she put her footnote, which is worth rereading, and say like, no, a defendant cannot argue that because a plaintiff had to obtain third-party funding to help enormous efforts put by that very sovereign nation who violated the rights in the first place to defend itself and got to the finish line. And now the defendant who caused all that harm and caused massive delays and try to kind of run out of money, the counterparty is saying you should not give them full award because they used third party litigation provider. This is nonsense. No. So it's a wonderful footnote. It's, you know, one of the things that always strikes me is the law is not always fully rational or doesn't always come to fully rational conclusions, but a lot of times it does. And like from a rational standpoint, the fact that you have somebody financing you so you can sue a more powerful party who damaged you, like, it shouldn't change any of the conclusions, right? Like it would have been great if Peterson had enough money to go see this through to the end. But the fact is Argentina threw them into bankruptcy by doing this, right? And Burford being there actually helped 
affect justice here. And if you said, hey, Burford couldn't fund this, so they couldn't pursue this, then you're basically saying, hey, sovereigns, you can go screw over your counterparties because if you do and you do it good enough, then nobody will ever be able to hold you accountable. So it just from the the part of it, the rational part of me, I just I, I love that piece of it. Yes, from the policy perspective, I agree with you 100%. Yep. Cool. Anyway, so I, I let's go, go back. So the ruling's been entered. Uh, at this point, let's start talking about enforcement. You said the only way they can enforce at this point is A, if the judge or an appeals court issues an emergency stay, or B, if in the extremely unlikely event that an insurance company is willing to write a 12 to $16 billion bond that would say, hey, once all the appeals are exhausted, Burford will collect 100 cents on the dollar because they'll collect this bond once they're, all the appeals are exhausted. Both of those are probably aren't happening. So let's talk a little bit about the enforcement and how you see. Uh, you know, Burford now is owed 16 point, sorry, Argentina owes $16.1 billion to Eden Park plus Peterson combined. That will compound at about 5.24% uh, compound interest going forward. That's the post judgment interest. So the question is going to be, how does Burford, the Peterson Eden Park claimants, how do they start collecting? How much can they collect? So why don't we talk about that? Okay, let's talk about collection. Just to clarify a couple of numbers here. 16 billion, this is the headline number, yep. including damages itself yep. and pre-judgment interest that ran at 8%. It was simple, not compounded. Yep. This this is the number that will go to Pet Peterson pretty yep. mostly, and a little bit of will go to Eden Park because they owned a lot less shares, a lot fewer yep. shares. However, Burford will receive only a portion of that. Not all 16 billion go to Burford. I just don't want anybody who is new to Burford topic think that it's 16 billion going all to Burford. It's before, you can vouch for my numbers, before any discounts, any haircuts, any taxes, any incentive fees that go to the Burford things, if Burford collected their full share, so the, you know, the $16 billion, 100 cents come through, if Burford collects all of that, their share would round to $6.3 billion, is what my math says. Correct. It's about 6.29, exactly, billion. And if we talk, if we take the Burford share account outstanding and divide it per share, it's about $20.70. I have it as $28.32 per share. So I don't uh, want to have... Possible, it. It's possible that I may be using weighted average and you're using end, end of the period. It's possible that mm. I'm using end of the period and you're using weighted. Or maybe you included how, some options. How many, how many shares do you have out? Do you know? So in the in this mass that because I think they have 220 million shares, and I don't want to get into a, a an Excel talk on a podcast because I'm sure that's not interesting. I've got 6.3 billion divided by 220, and that gets you to 28 dollars and 57 cents per share. Is kind of the rough math I've got. So I'm using 220 million shares. I think you've got a. Uh, I think you've just got a quick Excel error or something there. Of but let, let's not get too dragged down by it. Yes, uh, definitely less important. So I'm happy to work, to work with your number. So which number do you have? I've got 6.3 divided by 220 comes out to $28 per share. Yeah, perfect. If exactly. there was no discount. Yes, to $28, good to me. So that's the number. Now, collection. So there is Did you originally say 28 or 20? I heard 20 when you said it. No, 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 I did not say 20. Oh, I, I heard 20. Yeah, we're on the same page. Okay, great. I think, great. I think we yeah. were, you and I were off by like 30 cents. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I I would never argue over 30 cents. Yeah, I, yeah. I heard 20 versus 28. Which no, no, is... and, and, and that's why I said maybe I used... Oh, oh, no big deal. Absolutely no big deal. Yeah, who cares? Period, and it's like, no, no, it, it was a very tiny number. Yeah. So don't worry, eight dollars did not disappear. It, 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 I thought it was eight dollars. I was like, ooh, no, me, me and Artem no, are way off here. Yeah. Okay. No, no, great. No, great. No, great. No, like we're, we're on the same page. So when we talk about collection, in my opinion, there are two important ideas that we need to address first, and it's partially addressing ideas, partially fighting mis mis misperceptions. A big idea number one: Burford does not need to collect the entire 16 billion from Argentina via pursuing enforcement and collection. That's big idea number one. Big idea number two, you need either collect or threaten to collect and create enough nuisance value where you where Burford will be forcing the counterparty, the sovereign nation, to sit at the negotiation table and figure out a settlement. Many people, based on my observations, like 
16 billion sounds surely very nice, but how are they going to collect all that money? And the answer you don't have to. You need to collect a little bit. And then there is idea number three, which is there is a big difference between financial value and strategic value. Financial value of certain enforcement strategy can be very, very small. Maybe $3 million, $5 million, which is nothing when we talk about $16 billion a world. However, strategic value and disturbance and disruption to the otherwise smooth operational processes of Argentina or related entities can be tremendous. I totally agree. I'm just shutting the door that opened up. Like, so one thing... Imagine that one thing I think a lot of people have been saying is I can't remember if it was Karen Energy or Seneca Energy, but Burford helped them to I believe Burford helped them to enforce. And what they did was it it was a judgment against India and India bought some of their ambassadors apartments. And now you cannot seize things that a country is using in their uh in the function of being a country, right? So you can't go seize the Argentinian embassy or the, in this case, the Indian embassy. But India had bought some of their ambassadors' apartments in Paris. And the company, they used this judgment to go seize the ambassadors' apartments in Paris. And guess what? The ambassadors are like very high ranking, very influential officials. And when they come home and all of their, they cannot get into their apartment and they do not have a home and you know their family's there and there's people locking the doors and they call up and they say, hey, we lost our home, all of a sudden, a few weeks later, the government is sitting at, down at the table and settling. And I think that, as you said, the apartments, you know, they're, pro they're Paris apartments. They're worth two or $5 million. They're not worth a lot financially, but strategically you have, you know, shut down the lives of these high ranking influential people, very strategically valuable. And I don't know what, uh, I don't know if Argentina, if Argentina has bought apartments for their ambassadors, but I bet you there are several strategic assets like that, that Burford has lined up and has thought, hey, this doesn't really move the needle on $16 billion financially, but strategically, this is going to throw a lot of sand into the gears for Argentina and get them to the table with us. Correct. And uh, I am not privy of the details of uh, the enforcement action where uh, um, uh, apartments in Paris were seized. Uh, but I will add a couple of points there. And uh, again, I don't know all the facts of that particular situation. So the big concept that you, Andrew, alluded to, but I want to re-highlight here is this. Every country has two capacities, egos or alter egos, whatever you call them. One is sovereign nation. So for example, as a sovereign nation, you have a military aircraft. As a sovereign nation, you have embassy in Washington, D.C., or consulate in New York or San Francisco. After losing a commercial dispute, which was a commercial dispute in the southern yep. uh, district of New York, a plaintiff cannot go and say, hey, I'm going to grab your embassy. Like, no, like, unfortunately, fortunately, that's not allowed. However, many nations, or rather all nations, also have various roles where they act as a commercial entity. Broadly defined, it can be export import operations, selling your own oil that you extract or your copper or whatever the case is. And in that case, you cannot, you can actually go after those assets because they yep. have nothing to do with the country being a member of United Nations or passing international resolutions or participating in any other activity as a sovereign. In your example of what I find very interesting about your example, and I've heard about it as well about the India and apartments, what I don't know is this. If I were to represent India in that situation, I would go to a court with the, with the jurisdiction over this matter. In this case, I assume it will be somewhere in Paris. And I would say, Your Honor, in, in French, which I don't speak, so it will be difficult, but I will try. Uh, I would say, Your Honor, this is ambassador's apartment. Am ambassador acts on behalf of the sovereign nation. Yes. We bought this apartment for our ambassador, but it's not a commercial activity. We bought it for our government employee, high-ranking employee that performs important functions to live in. We're still acting here as a sovereign nation. You cannot take it over. Now, and I think it's a winning argument. I cannot guarantee that, but I think it's a winning argument. And But, but I will get there and I will try to reconcile what yeah. you said and what I think here. And what I've heard of this and what I heard about this story. Um, now it will be very different 
if in this case India or any other country bought an apartment in Paris and it was renting it over on the Airbnb to Andrew or Arts and when we fly to Paris. Sure, that's commercial activity. However, this is very important. I would not be surprised if a party in again, I'm using this as a hypothetical, this India situation, because I don't know the details. I would not be surprised if it was the decision, the process worked like this. Let's try to seize and freeze as many assets as we can, disrupt the functioning of the government. Yep. And then we'll go to court and debate in court ad nauseum whether this particular apartment is protected by sovereign immunity or not, because that's a complicated legal argument. And, uh, you know, to use the India example, and I'm with you, I... I don't know the I don't know this particular press and call it off my head. I just know the overall story I heard. But hey, hey, maybe India argues you can't seize our ambassador's apartment. And Paris says, OK, you're right. But then India has bought all the assistant ambassador's apartments. And then you have to have a debate. Hey, can you seize the assistant ambassador's apartment? Can you seize the security guys department? Like, you know, there's just probably 50 apartments there. And at some point you are going to get to the point where the court says, hey, like, no, you didn't need to buy all these apartments for all these people. And it, as you said, you're just throwing sand into the gear. And uh, it, yeah. it, it's it's not huge dollar value, but it's very disruptive. And if they run a run a run a country like it's better to it's better for everyone if they kind of get these settlements disputed, because it's really going to bring a lot of personal headache to a lot of heart, high ranking people. Correct. Another example. And again, uh- Burford, rightfully so, does not comment on its enforcement strategy. Yeah. What we only can do is we can look at prior cases in the history of worldwide jurisprudence where certain judgments were enforced against sovereign nations and see what was done in those cases and see, hey, maybe Burford can borrow from that playbook and do that. And also, let's not forget that Burford has an enforcement arm within Burford that does that those things for a living. In other words, if there is any company on the planet that is positioned to do this type of activities, probably will be Burford. Look, not only do they have an enforcement arm, I mean, nobody, it's not like sports where you can point to this is the best, this is the best sports team. We've played a game, we've, but they have an enforcement arm that I believe is widely regarded as the best enforcement arm in the world, right? So not only do they have an arm, they've got what's widely regarded as the best arm. And as they've said on their calls, hey, this is a massive judgment, right? It's like four times our book value, five times our book value at face. We have been thinking about this for years. You can expect that we've worked with our enforcement arm, like we've got a strategy, we're ready to go. And I've said this previously, so I'll say it now, like I am probably less bullish based on my loose talks with them and what I've heard. I'm less bullish on the recovery number than I think they are. But you know, my benefit of the doubt, I'd give it to them because they are the experts. They are the ones who know what their plan is. So uh, just to throw that out there. Uh, That's fair. I would also build upon that by saying throughout the history of Peterson legal proceedings, the number of people who said Peterson is a zero, Peterson will be paid in pesos. Muddy Waters famously is on the record on Twitter and on their short report saying that Peterson is zero or they will get paid in pesos. It's worthless. So it, go back, I think it's March 20th or something like this of 2020, you can find the tweet. And so far, Burford has proven all people who were skeptical wrong. Burford bought these claims. Now, I think they bought a couple on top of this, but the, the core of their holdings, they paid $16 million for. And now if Burford collected 100% of face value, they would get about $6 billion. And they've already monetized about $100 million of it, right? So they've already made more than their money off of it. And they, there's a lot like this is, a, as we said in our last podcast, this is a Facebook style venture investment. And you only get that because for years, people doubted that Peterson, they'd ever recover. People thought it was a zero. I think when you and I got involved, it, it was, especially me, it was much later and it was clear that there was going to be, there was likely to be value here. But, you know, people have always doubted it. So, yeah. Correct. So, but let's go back to other examples of what could be done on the collection effort. For example, Argentina have, as, a, as a sovereign, as a government, owns a number of uh, commercial enterprises. For example, I believe, and everybody, you should check that, I can be mistaken, I believe that Argentina owns 100% of the, or at least control, of the, of the airlines of Argentina. It means that, and by the way, they own many other commercial enterprises, either 100% or less. So, and what is important is that if it's a wholly owned government entity that conducts commercial activity, the defend, uh, the plaintiff who has an outstanding judgment 
can go after the assets of the commercial entity. Mm -hmm. You need to prove ownership, which is generally not that difficult to do. And you need to prove control by the government. For example, if a representative of the Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Finance or name any other government entity sits on the board and participates in quarterly or annual or semi-annual meetings, et cetera, et cetera, that's it, what lawyers will call indicia of control, an indicator of control. And if you prove ownership of control, you can go after those assets. And Argentina has a number of the such enterprises that do business internationally. Another example, if Argentina does export of some of its natural resources, they may or may not, I don't know, have a trading company in Switzerland or in Ireland or Luxembourg or any other place where they choose to have a trading company from a legal perspective. In that case, freezing that company may have very nominal value because it may be trading company, money coming in in the morning, they live in the afternoon. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the book value of the company can be diminished. But strategic value for proper functioning of the commerce is massive. This is That is one specific example when I talked to one of the Burford formers and people can find the links, that is one specific example they mentioned. Hey, you start seizing trading companies and there's not really money there, but all of a sudden Argentina finds it hard to do any trade with name your country once you've seized that. Like the bank accounts just stop functioning. You can't trade. And yeah, there was no nominal value there, but strategic value, all of a sudden you're, you could shut off huge pieces of their GDP. And th that's another thing that can just bring them to the table to force a settlement. It gets even worse to build upon what you said. Not only Argentina in this case cannot function properly. Imagine how happy would be their counterparties. Like, wait a second. We send you money, but you cannot send us whatever, it is, whether it's oil or something else. You cannot sell us. You cannot send it to us. Why? Ah, because you have outstanding judgment. Wonderful. We need to find another counterparty. So it's get embarrassing at the perception level. But also, you it could, it may or may not trigger subsequent lawsuits by your counterparties who have not been, who have been paying you properly, but have not been receiving what they need. So it gets very, very complicated. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Let me ask on timing. I believe the enforceability starts, I, I can't remember if enforceability starts now that the final judgment's been entered or if it starts 30 days after a final judgment. Do you, do you know? Uh, don't hold me for that. I believe it's 30 days. I think it's 30 days too. I had that tickling in my mind because I, I was kind of wondering, you know, the final judgment got entered on Friday. I was wondering if we wake up Monday morning and see like Argentina <laughs> like wooden boat off the coast the seas or something. So, but I, I would not be surprised. We're talking September 20th. The final judgment came September 15th, I think was the day. I, I would not be surprised if October 18th, we start seeing little signs of this company freeze, this bank account freeze, like little things. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing quick wins from uh, uh, Burford. So let me turn to this. We've discussed that people, I, I just want to hit bottom line. Like as you and I sit here, now the enforcement starts, now the settlement starts thinking, how are you thinking of the valuation of Burford's Peterson and Eden Park claims right now? So I would guess that the end game here is to, through all those activities that you and I discussed and shared, you shared your thoughts, I shared my thoughts. And I think the game plan here is to get the counterparty, Argentina, to the negotiation table and say, okay, let's make peace and figure out what we can do. And in that case, probably it will be some sort of installment plan, you know, like yep. buy now, pay later on a firm or Klarna, right? So <laughs> it's something like this in a way. 
So where it will be some installment plan, pr presumably there will be some cash component up front. And then there will be an installment plan running several years. It's with certain amounts. And Argentina will be paying everybody involved here. In exchange, Argentina should legitimately ask for a lower price point. So 16 billion should be haircut by some substantial amount. You and I spoke last time with you, and I think uh, the range was somewhere for a haircut between 40 and 60 percent. That was kind of the range that you and I collectively, I believe, thought was reasonable. Could it be higher? Possible. Could it be lower? Also possible. It partially depends on the structure of that settlement. If yep. it's like if it's five billion tomorrow or October 18 or 19, and then 500 million for the next five years, that's a lot more valuable than one billion today and pick a number of installment sales for the next 10 years. So it's time value of money exercise as well. So it's not only notional haircut, but also time value of money in this structure of the deal. And people need to remember Argentina, one of my favorite quotes when I was reading up on this is there's like the international history, the history of international sovereign defaults or something. And the first line is there have been, you know, 28 sovereign defaults in the modern era, era and half of them are Argentina. So when people are thinking the time value of money, you have to remember it's not just discount rate. It's the fact like you're discounting Argentina discount rate. So there's going to be a high... Hmm. Let's get as much of it up front because there's a decent chance of another default in six years or something. Oh, okay, so yes and no. Those papers, legal papers written by legal scholars that you're referring to, mostly deal with default of sovereign nations defaulting on their sovereign debt. Very true. Very That's true. different, right? Yep. In this case, in, and this is important, if I were Burford, the deal structure would be, again, I'm picking up these numbers like $5 billion today. Okay, let's say $3 billion today and then... One billion for the next five years every year. Yeah. Right? Just like it's hypothetical to be clear. Let's say it happens and three billion gets wide, a year goes by, Burford picks up the phone and says, Minister of Finance, we haven't checked, uh, we have not received check for one for the next billion. Uh, would you like me to dictate you the numbers of my checking account? And like, no, no, it's fine. I have it. We're not sending. So in that case, the way you structure the agreement, you had 16 billion, we cut it by 50% just for the sake of the argument. You paid in our example three, so it should be eight minus three, five, five is old. That five will immediately revert back to 16 minus three, which is 13. Yep, yep. And then you go and enforce, and you go, presumably, you go to the court and say, most likely we'll be in Southern District of New York, and you say, Your Honor, we had this agreement with Argentina, they wired us three billion and they're missing the next payment. An agreement says that if you miss a payment by more than 30 days, it, it balloons back to 16 billion. Now, example minus three that already yep. we need 13 billion. You do not go, you are not sitting at the same table with the bondholders of a bond that defaulted again, if it happens again, right? You are, you have your own separate small table. It's like there is you know, cheap cafeteria, and there's very expensive gourmet restaurants with three Michelin stars. You are at that table. The the way one of the, the calls I did described it, they were like, look, if you get a, a lump sum payment up front, and then they default on the payment on, on one of the principal, sorry, one of the settlement payments on the back end, it's almost the best of all worlds, right? You've gotten some of your money up front, and mm -hmm. then it's so easy to go and start collecting again. And now you're looking at full face value. So the company... The country is really incentivized not to do that second default because if they do, they paid full face value on the upfront payment, and now you're just collecting again. So it's just a disaster for them. Is kind of how they they laid it out to me. That's I very much agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So, but so forty to sixty percent uh, haircuts. I agree with you. You know, I, I still think that the number that I kept hearing from people was, "Hey, up." Uh, in NPV terms, they're not getting an $8 billion upfront check tomorrow. Argentina just doesn't have that much cash. But in NPV terms, most of what I've heard from like people who are better at collection than me have said about 50% of face is probably where a settlement should should shake out. And that's probably like, you know, $2 billion up front with uh, $2 billion of payments every two years after that for the next 12 years or something would, would be about how they would look at it. I think that's right. So, you know, if you said... You tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I've kind of been thinking, hey, in, in my model, I think about a 50% haircut 
is about where I think. And, you know, in a bear case, maybe it's a 60% haircut. And in a bull case, maybe it's a 40% haircut. But that's how I've been personally it's, thinking. I, I think it's very reasonable. Yeah. One thought that I would put out there, and uh, I could easily argue against this thought myself, but it's still worthwhile to remember. Rap Soul, yep. if I'm not mistaken, settled pretty much on 50 cents on the dollar. I think that's right. And people have argued, oh, there were political reasons and country reasons. And I hear that, but there's going to be political reasons to settle the Peterson case for 50 okay. cents on the dollar at some point too. Okay. This is very important. So number one, Repsol and Argentina settled 50 cents on the dollar very, 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 very early. There was no, the legal case hasn't even started really yet. Yep. They settled. Now, I'm not privy to Argentinian politics or Spanish politics. If I were to guess, probably Repsol, being a big multinational company out of Spain, probably asked Spanish government, said like, hey, could you help us broker yeah. a deal or do something? Like, you as a government should protect co your corporations. Very reasonable view. And it's very possible that Spain indeed tried to help. I don't know, but I would not be surprised. So that's positive. On the other hand, at that point in time, Repsol did not have any stick. Zero, literally. They could not go and freeze your assets. They cannot freeze your Swiss or Guernsey or Jersey trading company. They couldn't do anything. It was simply early. Heck, they couldn't even point to, hey, if we sue you and take you all the way through, we will win, right? They couldn't Correct. even point to that at that point. And Berger certainly can point to that. Correct. So that would argue for a smaller discount than 50%. How it will happen, I don't know. Now, what I think will be I think it's also a fascinating study in this. So Chris Bargant and Jonathan Malone, two brilliant lawyers, and uh, Jonathan also is a brilliant legal scholar, started Burr for 21st time. And understandably, in back in 09. And finance, you know, small matter here, small matter there, I and mean, relatively small, right? And they've grown, grown, grown. So I would not be surprised if in three months from now, Chris Bogart and Jonathan Malone will be finding themselves inside an IMF conference room where they will be debating with IMF officials or World Bank officials or whoever else could be involved, where they will be saying, Mr. Bogart and Mr. Mollett, we need Argentina to be active member of international community and trade and commerce and blah, blah, blah. So help us out, find a solution where they will be saying, Listen, we owe fiduciary duty to our shareholders. We're entitled to 16 billion and we're not going to give 50% haircut. We need 80% on the dollar or something. By the way, another fascinating possibility, and by the way, I don't think it's going to happen, but something to entertain. You can also get a backstop from IMF. Argentina yep. will pay you 3 billion upfront and 1 billion for the next five years. And IMF is a guarantor. For example, to be clear, I don't know whether IMF allowed by its bylaws and other charter documents to do that. It's possible that it's not allowed. I'm not opining on that. I don't know. But something like this is a thought experiment. It's interesting. Will IMF want to get involved? Maybe yes, maybe no. We'll find out. What I'm saying is that I think Chris Bogart and Jonathan Malone finding themselves in a new kind of uncharted territory, which will be very interesting to watch as a shareholder. You, and as an investor in general, it would be interesting to watch the evolution of the management team. You are absolutely not the only one who has said, look, there are going to be, it's a big award. It's New York jur jurisdiction. The IMF, in, in some way or shape or form, will come into play, whether it's them calling the company in and saying, hey, how can we negotiate and maybe backstop, maybe give you something, or whether it's the IMF going to Argentina and be like, we cannot get you funds if you have this outstanding judgment and they are enforcing on it, we simply can't get you funds. You need to go settle. And yeah, it sucks for you. You need to settle a 16 billion, but do you want IMF loans? Do you want IMF money? That's gotta be out the way. Let me turn to, so we said 50%, 50 cents on the dollar is kind of our base case. If people want, if you do the math there, that would imply a net award to Burford of, well, actually there's one other thing I wanna talk about, taxes. I think both you and I have, mainly you, cause you were the one who suggested to me and I, I've just, done some work to confirm, but it taxes. Burford has said frequently over time, you can find this in their 20th. Over time, we expect our tax rate to flow to the low to mid teens is kind of what they've said on the tax rate. I think a lot of people take that to mean, hey, your cost basis in Peterson is basically zero. So anything you get from Argentina, let's apply a 12% tax rate to it, right? 
And I think both you and I, I don't want to spoil it, but I think both of you and I think, hey, you know, tax rate might be lower here. So alternative view, how are you thinking about the taxes on any proceeds Burford gets from YPF? Okay, so punchline, I think it will be de minimis. And I believe this is right now non-consensus view. And you and I spoke about this. I don't remember whether it came up on the last podcast or not, but I've held this view for a very, very long time. So that's number, that's punchline. Now, the next question becomes, wait a second, how is it possible? Like, you're getting all this money, blah, 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 right? So now, remember, Burford is a currency company. They have presence across multiple other countries. UK, London, US via Chicago and New York, maybe some other cities I forgot right now, uh, etc. And people are assuming that someone, some taxing jurisdiction, meaning some country, will tax it. And the question becomes, which country? So it's not currency because they don't really tax. Um, UK, okay, unlikely because there is no real linkage between this case and UK. So I assume that people by default assume that the United States of America will exercise its tax jurisdiction and tax this proceeds. So the next question becomes, what are the grounds? So now we're getting into a quick tax international tax tutorial in 20 seconds. Do you know any former international tax attorneys who might be- uh, well, Who might be on this call? <laughs> <laughs> For exactly. those who don't know, uh, Arden, do you wanna say what you did in a prior life? Yeah, so in the prior life, uh, when I came to the U.S. in 2004, I came to study a law. I, do, I, I came to do, my, to do Master of Laws in International Tax Law Program at NYU School of Law, which quick advertisement, which is unpaid for my uh, legal alma mater in the U.S., which has the best tax program in the country, maybe worldwide. So, and then I practiced at a law firm called Greenbridge Traurig in New York for about three and a half years. And then I went to Stanford for business school and then I went into investing. But, so the bottom line is, the bottom. is literally a former international tax attorney. So he, he's not just me, some random dude in the hat commenting on this. He, he actually knows his stuff here. So with that caveat, and I appreciate the compliments, I will say that it's impossible to know with certainty unless you're inside the company. It's just impossible. Based on... As public investors in pretty much any company that we invest in, we actually have no real idea what's going on inside in terms of taxes. We got some idea because they report your income tax expense on the income statement. They report cash taxes or cash flow statement. And then they may or may not provide a little bit more color. But big picture, all investors are kind of flying blind. And by the way, so I love those situations where I come to the conclusion that taxes are very low. And whatever they report on the income statement is just noise and people miss that. So it, sometimes it creates an opportunity. So I think going back to Burford, let me share the screen with you. And I apologize to those who are listening to this instead uh, of watching so, YouTube. Are, happy to have this screen share. Obviously, most people listen to this audio, so maybe they can I will the describe the, I, will describe I just want to make sure if you share something, it. you're comfortable with it being shared on the YouTube because I will not oh, yeah. be able to pull it off if Look, you... I, I'm only I'm I'm sharing the document uh, 2022 Burford uh, annual report. Okay, okay. So this is in public domain. Anybody can pull it out anytime they want. Let's see. see. Uh, I cannot see it. Uh, holes disabled. Uh, why don't you just talk me through okay. it real quick? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, that's what I will encourage people to do. Go to page 25 of the PDF of the 2022 annual report. It lays out Burford uh, capital structure. Oh, so, sorry, uh, corporate structure. I feel very confident that it's grossly oversimplified. I, I can vouch for that, yes. So, simplistically, at the top you have currency company. Then you got, and I will ignore some of that which is less relevant for our matter. But then you got side by side, another currency holding company, and then you got UK holding company. And most of the US operations come under UK holding company. And what is important here is that Burford Capital LLC is US operating company. So like, keep this in mind, this is LLC. How U.S. may exercise tax jurisdiction over Peterson is two or threefold, depending on how you cut this pie. Mm -hmm. Possibility number one, based on residence, meaning a company that is a U.S. company doing business in the U.S. 
derive certain income, and that income is taxed by the U.S. No different from making widgets or making Coca-Cola in the U.S. That's one possibility. Another possibility, if income is derived by foreign person, receives what is called U.S. source income. For example, if U.S. company pays dividends to a shareholder in Germany or Switzerland, it will be U.S. source income because it's de defined by the residence of the payor, so paying company. And in that case, U.S. will impose what is known as withholding tax. So let's first address the residence matter here. And, and, and by the way, there is also another possibility where a foreign person doing business in the U.S. without creating a company, but they are here, they're running around, they're doing stuff. In that case, U.S. will view such foreign entity having, this is in quotes, engaged in U.S. trade or yep, business. Yep, yep, yep. And then there is this concept of ECI, effectively connected income. And if there is a foreign person, individual or entity that, that is engaged in U.S. trade or business and derives effectively connected income with that U.S. trade or business, U.S. will tax it. Okay? So now, I suspect that the part of Burfo structure that relates to this is probably relies on an exception in the tax code under Section 864, which is trading for your own account. And I believe that's, that's why Peterson proceeds should not be taxed in the hands of Burford. And I think there is, so when you first mentioned it to me, because you were the first one who mentioned it to me, I was skeptical. And I will say, if you talk, if you've talked to Burford or our, if you listen to their uh, most recent earnings call, people ask, hey, what's the tax rate? And I feel like they're somewhat cagey where they say we've guided to our tax rate over time, but they talk, they're they talking two different things, right? I'll ask them, what's the tax rate? And they'll say, what's the tax rate on YPF? And they'll say, we've guided to our tax rate over time, which I think is them kind of like playing coy so they don't have to say we're pay paying nothing. But there's one example you pointed me to that I think is really yes. powerful evidence that they will not pay yes. taxes here. Do you want to talk about that? Because yes. you're the one who pointed out to me. So, and then, so what, what I describe here gives me more of a foundation to think that there may be a possibility that they're not paying taxes on Peterson in the US. But then I also believe there is a piece of tangible evidence. And this, for that, we need to go to 2019 financials. And let's remind what happened in 2019. In late June, I think June 26, but I can be off. Burford announced two things. They announced that Sover Supreme Court of the United States declined to take sovereign immunity defense and listen to that defense by Argentina. And immediately, Burford sold a good chunk, about 100 million. They received 100 million for 10% for, for at the time of their remaining entitlement to third parties. Which again, they invested sixteen million plus. They did expenses and they bought a little bit more. But this took more than all of their more than all their costs and cost basis Correct. off the table. Correct. That was the biggest sale of Patterson up to that point. Actually, up to this the only the only sale oh. of Patterson, I believe. No, 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 they, no, no, no. They, they did some more. You're right. They did some more. Yeah. There were, there were a couple of small sales earlier. Yeah. So, so there was a lot of money. What Andrew said was a lot of money, and you definitely would have had gains because it was such a big amount of proceeds. And if you look at cash, uh, if you look at cash taxes and income and income tax expense line item on board for 2019 annual report, you will see that those line items continue to be the minimums. And there is not that much observable difference between 2018 and 2019. That makes me think that that sale by Burford in 2019 was not subject to US tax jurisdiction. Yep. And that makes me think that there is no logical reason why subsequent realization events whether through sale or collection or settlement, should be taxed in the hands of Burford by U.S. either. Perfect. Again, can I be wrong? Yeah, I can be wrong. Like I, I'm not opining that this is truth. It's impossible to know it unless you're inside the company. As Andrew pointed out, Burford on public calls said, we're not common sense. Their position is back to this. Long term, it will be mid sins And we're not commenting on how any particular case is taxed. That's their position. I respect that. So I can only do my own work and try to figure out what's happening, I, but I don't know. And just so people know, so I, I want to move on to the core business now because I think we've covered YPF pretty nice. But just so people know, Arden Mai said, hey, 
uh, 50% haircut is about right here. If you do 50% haircut and you think there's zero tax rate on it, and I've got, they've got to a little bit of incentive fees on this and stuff. If you say 0% haircut, uh, YPF's claim, the YPF and Peterson claims would be worth about 1350 per Burford share. If you bump that tax rate up to 13%, it'd be worth about 1150 per share. So you're talking about a $2 per share difference, which is material on a $15 stock as we talked about. But again, YPF, you know, at 11 versus 15, at 11 on a 15 stock, it's a huge piece of the proceeds. 13 on 15 is a huge piece of the proceeds. All right, we've talked YPF extensively. I'm going to force move us over. And look, this, okay. No, no, you, there this, is one more thing, which is relevant. And uh, it came up on the last call as well, on the earnings call. And Burford doesn't give an answer. So I am using all publicly available data here to come to my own conclusion. But... Have you, uh, remember Mission Impossible? I think it was four when Tom Cruise is in Moscow. Okay. No, 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 no. Sorry, it was it was the next one. Uh, do, do you remember when he's one of his associates is uh, testifying instead of in, in front of the Congress and he's being asked uh, different difficult questions and he says, "I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of such operation without a secretary prior approval." And the secretary was killed, and there is nobody who approved that. So this actor keeps saying, "Like I can neither confirm nor deny." Right. So. Now, uh, it's a little bit how Burford answered this question when they were asked, do, do any of the funds that you merge bought YPF? Great point. Yes, yes, great right? point. And like, we can neither come from the deny and, and, look, and understand, right? They, there are tons of legal limitations on what they can say. And there may be confidentiality agreements. There may be many, many, many other things. So they don't say. They said we can either confirm or not, but there might be press reports on if some of the funds we manage have have exposure or not, which I... Well, yeah. Yes. And now, uh, back in 2019, maybe 19, maybe 20, there were reports that Burford, that funds managed by Burford bought about 30 million out of those 100 million that Burford sold. Yep. And remember, at the time, it was a big transaction because about 100, 100 million was sold by Burford. And then unrelated parties also traded around as part of that big deal. And I think it was around another 40 or change. So it was like good amount traded hands. And some reporters found out that 30 million, 30, was purchased by Burford managed funds. Muddy Waters used it as a claim to say that entire mark on Peterson is bogus because yep, it's yep, unrelated yep. parties. Burford publicly in writing, and I believe on the calls, I believe in both, commented, listen, we cannot comment on that. But what we can tell you is that there is a bunch of securities laws in the US that would prohibit funds from doing a related party transaction with the management company. And if you do that, you're going to get yourself into trouble. What it means is that limited partners alone, and typically it's done by a limited partners advisory committee, could get together and say, we like this deal. We don't care whether we like this investment. We don't care that it's a related party. We still want it. And in that case, a manager can sell something to the fund. And it's very helpful if you have third parties that are doing it at the same time Correct. that are giving you a mark. So there's, yep, 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 yep. Correct. Because in that case, it's not like they set up some price. No, there's entire market. So that's what Burford said. And they said, we cannot comment what it happened. But if it, did, but if it, it had happened, then that would have been a procedure. So we believe that it would have been proper anyway. If you go and download uh, the PDF file from Burford website with uh, the, where they give you this eight or, or by now probably 11 pages PDF with this tiny, 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 tiny font, which you need a uh, magnifying glass to look at, where they give you every single case. Yep. You will see an interesting thing. A new case appeared on June 30th, 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And commitment, so it didn't, that case did not exist on December 31st, 2018. It appeared on June 30th, 2019. And so it's six months. And committed capital and deployed capital was immediately the same number, 30. We know that generally it takes some time to commit capital and then deploy capital. Normally, those de deployments take time, sometimes a year, sometimes two years, it could be even longer. In that case, it was 30 and 30, which is unusual. And I think it matches very nicely with the theory that 
public, more public that was disseminated by reporters, that about 30 million was invested by Burford funds. And uh, it was Burford Opportunities Fund, not sovereign wealth, but BOF, based on that document. So my hypothesis is that that's the same case. And why is it, why is it relevant? Well, I think it's relevant for this reason. 30, th that valuation was about, and we don't know all the, all the numbers here, but this is my understanding. Burford at the time owned 71.25% of, 71.5% uh, out of the entitlement from Peterson. And that 71.5% was valued at a billion. And they sold 10% of that 71.5 for 100. Again, I, I need to approximate here because I don't have all the inputs. But most likely that 1 billion today is clo closer. So sorry, that 100 million in terms of notional value is probably closer to 16 billion divided by 0.7 roughly. And then you take 10% of that. So again, that mass is flawed. I don't know the exact mass, but it's a quite a substantial number. That's my main point. It's called 7% of 16 billion, roughly, I think. That would be, <clears throat> call it close to a billion dollars. Is my math right? Well, I, I I think there's an easier way to do it, which is when they sold, they valued at a billion dollars, $16 billion headline number. I think what you actually want to do is say, hey, you and I have been saying that uh, they're going to get 50 cents on the dollar is the haircut. So I think that billion dollar valuation, if I'm right, would be worth 8 billion. So the 100 the hundred million value they sold let's, would be let's worth do 800 the million. Go ahead. Let's do before the haircut. But I think you're taking, you're equating 1 billion to 16 billion. And I'm saying that 1 billion is equivalent to 71.5% of 16 billion. Mm, okay. Okay. That, so that's where we're- different. I see what you're saying. Yep. I see what you're saying. Yep. Again, it, it's possible that, and again, I think I'm missing some inputs. So I'm really approximating here. But if it's seven, per, but if it's 10% of 71.5%, 10 percentage points, 10%. Of 71.5%, it's seven percentage points, roughly, of entire 16 billion, and 16 billion multiplied by 7%. I How much then? Sorry, I, I was looking at I was just looking at the numbers. Seven percent of 16 billion. Okay. Yeah. Uh what's it's approaching 1.1, is that right? Yeah, so I, I threw one billion just like rounding, but because I'm sure I'm missing some leakage there. And uh if my hypothesis is correct, 30 million just turned into 1 billion notional. Let's use 1 billion because it's easy math, right? Let's do a haircut. It will be 600 million using 40% haircut. Again, 30 just multiplies nicely into, six, into 600. That's what I'm doing. Or you can you do 50% haircut. It will be 500 million. 30 cost basis, call it 470. And Burfer, if it's indeed BOF, is entitled to get 20% incentive fee on this number. So it's approaching 100 million. Uh, of the incentive fee, I I think you're a little too high. I, I don't want to belabor the point because 100 million is 50 cents. I I think you're a little too high, but I don't want to belabor the point because I do want to talk about the rest of the business. But and, and I mean, notion. this is notional. This is notional amounts, yeah. uh, meaning before haircuts. But the bottom line is whether it's 20 million, 50 million, 100 million. There's going to be. It seems there's set up to be a nice incentive fee here that Burford's going to get. Which you know, if it's 20 million, that's 10 cents. That's an extra 10 cents per share of value. If it's 100 million, that's an extra 50 cents. But there's a nice on top of everything we've talked about. There's incentive fees coming. All right, yeah. that's why PF. We might have to do this as a two part podcast where we just break it up because this is going to be the longest podcast we've ever done. This is why on Twitter I said two hours or three hours. But let's talk about the core business because yeah. look, the YPF stuff is exciting. It's a 15 dollar stock. You and I have said the fair value here is uh, over 66% of the stock value just from the YPF claims, right? But the core business is doing really well. I personally have a hypothesis that the core business is going to do better on the heels of this because I think people are going to get more excited. But let's talk about how you look at and think about the core business today. And we probably don't need to go too deep because especially the first podcast, I think we did a really nice job hitting on it. But let's talk about the core business today. So based on, so Burford reported second quarter results couple of weeks ago, September 13, so actually one week ago, so very new. And in my opinion, the results were quite solid. Mm -hmm. I would also add that the changes in accounting 
have made already complex reporting even more complex. Yes, agreed. I would also add that, in my humble opinion, Burford doing quarterly reports is not a very good fit for the business. They have to report, that's why they're doing that. But I think semi annual was a lot better cadence. Frankly, I think annual is a lot better cadence. Do you remember the story about Warren Buffett who said when he was running Buffett Partnership, he said to his LPs, I will be reporting to your results to you once a year and you will have an opportunity to leave or stay. And otherwise, I'm not talking to you. Well, you know, when you do 50%, I think Buffett Partnerships was doing 50% annualized. Uh, I think when you're doing 50% annualized, you know, I think it was Ted who did... He launched his fund, and the first thing he did was the post reorg. Uh, I, I think it was gr the Grace investment or whatever, and his fund was up like three x over two years when he, he launched his fund. Ted uh, Ted Weschler, the Buffett's, I understand. And, and or was it? I can't remember. But it, he, his fund was up three x over two years, and then he just sent his LPs a letter. He was like, "Hey, I'm just going to be writing you guys an annual letter now. I'm not going to report quarterly anymore." You know, when you do fifty percent IRR or you do three x in two years, you can write those letters. But for mere humans like me, I won't include you. But for mere humans like me, you can't you can't go with that. But I. I do understand what you're saying. This is a business that, you know, they make the legal investments today and they're probably, in Burford's case, it takes 10 years to realize, like reporting quarterly versus semi-annually, there's not a lot to add a, a lot of the times. Like it, it's it's focusing too much on the forest and missing the trees or focusing too much on the trees and missing the forest. Correct. So that that's the th 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 thought number three on this topic. Now, uh, let's talk about fair value methodology because that played an important role. So just by way of background, Securities and Change Commission in the U.S. and Burford had some conversations with, uh, which resulted in Burford changing its fair value methodology. Before, they were marking up cases up or down only on milestones, meaning judge issued a certain ruling. Judge, case went to appeal. We lost this petition. And if it's substantial enough, they will mark it up or down. And then now with new methodology, Burford is also marking based on time value of money. And conceptually, it makes sense. A case, holding everything else equal, a case that got launched two years ago with the same merits as the case launched yesterday should be a lot more valuable because we are two years closer to resolution. However, you need to apply some discount rate. And those discount rates are not constant. And as a result, Burford has been applying high discount rates for some period of time because rates were rising. That makes sense. And in the second quarter of 2023, application of high rates resulted in negative markdown of fair value of its part portfolio if you look at it at the aggregate level. And remember, Burford reports consolidated and then reports Burford only. I think consolidated is, has a lot of noise. I look mostly at Burford only. So Same. on the consolidated, if, and correct me if my numbers are off right now, I don't have Excel in front of me. So I believe that they had 94 million markdown at the consolidated level and 60 million plus at Burford only. That sounds correct to me. I don't I don't have all those tabs open. I'm kind of focused on this, but that all sounds about right to me. And obviously when you look at the income statement and you see that your revenue is not going the way it's supposed to be going. And this happens in the time period when Burford had its biggest win in its entire history, arguably. Mm -hmm. It raises questions, but that's the accounting. By the way, I expect that in the next probably couple of months, there will be filings where Burford and SSC, whatever they corresponded with each other, they would be posted. And sometimes those letters are really fun to read especially if you look at some companies that have gone public and then you pull out and like SEC says, you are not disclosing this metric properly. And the company like, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, here you go. And like, very interesting. They didn't want to report this metric. What does it mean? So sometimes it means nothing. Sometimes it means something. It's up to you to decide. So I think it will be very interesting to read those letters and exchange what Burford was advocating for and what SEC was advocating for. I think it will be fascinating, right? So I look forward to that. The other thing that, you know, in the Q3 earnings, they will report, uh, obviously, I don't believe that they they marked YPF up in Q1 and Q2 because they just had the prelim judgment. They didn't know what the rulings were. I think they might have done it a little bit, but they, the mar Q they, they, they marked it somewhat. I, I think it was a very small markup, but they it got the final small. judgment this month as we just spent over an hour discussing, right? So I will be very interested in the Q3 earnings 
what they mark the YPF rolling out because it'll be interesting to see how, how they're thinking about it. But I don't want to bring this back to YPF. So I would agree with you. Like, look, there is noise, right? Interest rates went up by about 2%. You know, if you kind of think interest rates going from three to 5% in a quarter, that makes a big, big difference if you're fair value and everything. So there was noise in the income statement. And I, I think a lot of people, a lot of headlines, there was a lot of commentary about in the print. But if you looked beyond that, you know, I think what Burford's saying, I think rightly, the business is just absolutely firing on all cylinders. All of the COVID delays are starting to resolve themselves. They deployed a lot of capital. And even XYPF, you're starting to see wins. You're starting to see a lot flow through. So I don't know if you want to talk about any of that. Um, look, so let's talk a little bit about this because this is important. As much as YPF is exciting from intellectual perspective, because it's a fascinating case, as well as from financial reward perspective, which is substantial, that's not why I got interested in the Burford in the first place. Yep. And uh, it's the core business that I think is very, very attractive and interesting. So let's talk about that. So I will start with, with this. Sometimes when very young students interview for banking internships or other internships, they ask like, hey, if you only could look at one financial statement out of three to evaluate a company, which one would you choose? And the right answer, of course, cash flow statement. So some people... Yeah, that's right. Some people don't, but that's yeah, it. You know, that, that is funny because I, I think I would say balance sheet. And here's my some reason. People, some people say that. Well, you didn't say what the company was. And if you looked at the cash flow statement for a bank, it would be completely meaningless, right? So uh, a Could, balance sheet statement, like at least I could see how much earnings they got from last year to this year. I could do a return on equity, like a cash flow statement. It's tough. I, I do hear you. But it, I, I think the right answer is actually, dude, you can't do that. Like every statement is connected to each other, but I, I hear you. I agree, I agree with you, right? This is the question that asks, you know, for junior positions. So, and why I'm bringing it up, the story is this. There are a few metrics in both for disclosures that have been consistent for many, many years and that we know, and I think they indicate the health of the business. So number one, I want to know commitments. So in other words, paraphrasing that question, if you ask me, Artem, if you could look on like five, six, seven metrics out of probably 25 or 30 that we have in Bullford reporting, which one would you choose? So they will be, I want to know commitments because this is the best leading indicator. I need to know deployments. I want to know realizations. Why? Because I want to see that those deployments at some point come back and they got cashed. Then I will want to know aggregate IRR and ROIC because that will show to me whether the business is, whether the quality of cases, the return reward profile is getting better, worse, or it's stable. Yeah. Those are the metrics that I would like to know. And th those five metrics alone probably should tell me enough about normalized top line revenue over some period of time. They're going to tell me nothing about next quarter revenue or even next year. But on a two, three, four year time horizon, they will tell me that. It's the same. Just think about it like a private equity firm, right? If you get 10 years of deployments and you can see what they're doing, like in private equity firms, there's obviously huge variability, probably more variability. Well, there's a lot here. But you know, if you've got 10 years worth of deployments and you can see consistently they're deploying at 20% IRRs and, and all that sort of stuff, you say, hey, this is a private equity firm that's probably doing pretty all right. Very similar. Very good analogy. Good. Yep. And then the last thing I will want to know is OPEX. Why? Because those five metrics, roughly, will tell me something about top line. And remember, top line is only gains, either realized or unrealized. That's not total proceeds. Yep. And OPEX will tell me, okay, are we spending too much money to run this business versus this magnitude of those gains that we're getting? So I will want to know OPEX. So, and I think on commitments that were up very, very nicely, deployments that were very nicely, Leading indicators to me are lining up very strong for Burford. Realize, and, and remember a couple of things. Burford reports group-wide commitments, group-wide deployments, Burford only, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, Burford have said publicly that they are deprioritizing the asset management business. They will be investing more and more from their own balance sheet. So I think it's a lot more important to look at Burford only commitments and deployments than group-wide. But even if you look at group wide, they're still growing very, very strongly. I just want to comment, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too. 
you know, a lot of people love the the private equity model where we take LPs money and we use that to invest. And then we just get the two and 20, right? We get the incentive fee and the management fee. They love that because that's a capital light business. That management fee is locked in. The incentive fee gives you plenty of upside still. And they love that. And Burford, they've got the asset management business, right? Which again, you could consider private equity. And they're actually going the other direction saying, we want to put more of our balance sheet in. And I know I have pushed them and a lot of people have pushed them. And like, dude, like at two and 20, that's the end all be all. You guys are actually getting three and 30 for some of these. Why aren't they you doing it? And they're saying, look, we only did that because we had so many cases. We couldn't fund them on our balance sheet. We wanted to do that. These cases are so attractive. The more of them we can keep for ourselves, the more value we'll, we'll create in the long run, which I think speaks to a shareholder and value shareholder friendly and value focused group. And I think is the right decision for anyone who's focused on like long-term value creation versus kind of short-term metrics, that type of stuff. I don't know if you agree, disagree. I'll toss that over to you. I can pretty much sign that petition. So that you just articulated, in my opinion, the key issue here is capacity. Yeah. If you could deploy unlimited amount of money, sure. Just deploy both your own balance sheet and 2 and 20. If it was investing in shares of Amazon, which is not investment recommendation, I don't know much about Amazon. So other than they sell books and I buy them, they and a bunch of other stuff. So if you are unlimited in terms of how much money you can invest, of course, like have both. It's terrific, 2 and 20, and you're paying a lot of salaries for your team just with other people's money while paying only a little bit with your core business. However, if it's capacity constraint strategy and you choose between the two, you probably want to prioritize your own capital. It this goes back why, to Greenblatt, who is like one of my you know, idol investors with uh, his uh, career trajectory where he was running a fund, Gotham Partners, and it was so successful with uh, the returns are disclosed in You Can't Be Stock Market Genius book and somewhere at the back that he had to return capital. Because Renaissance, the Renaissance Tech, a lot of these quant funds, they, they run huge money and they charge two and 20 and then they get big enough and they say, hey, our returns are starting to drag us down and we're all billionaires now. Return all the outside money and just run our, you know, we're, we're making 50% annualized, run it all our money and just keep returning all the outside money because you'd rather make a hugely risk attractive return. You know, maybe one day you and I will, will face the same issue. So Let's start. business firing all cylinders. I want to talk about value of the core business, but there is one question that I've gotten from several people that I have some answers. Nobody has a great answer here, but there was a widely publicized uh, Burford invested $140 million into Cisco antitrust claims. And it went off the rails. People can look. There was a little bit of it in the 60 minutes piece. There was some uh, back and forth. Burford actually published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal responding to it. But at this point, Burford controls the Cisco antitrust claims that they invested about $140 million into a year or two ago. And a lot of people have started saying $140 million, you know, that's 60 cents per share to Burford. I believe they own all of that stake. Uh, if you look at what they've done historically, there might be a real pot of gold sitting here uh, when this when this case comes to conclusion. Have you thought or talked to anyone about the Cisco claims in case here? Number one, I agree that it can be highly attractive. Number two, one of the pieces of indirect evidence that we have that it can be very attractive is because that there was a potential settlement that, according to Cisco, Burfer did not let them pursue. And that resulted in a dispute between Cisco and Burfer that subsequently was settled. So which makes me think that the settlement that was on the table was not big enough. It means that there is probably how much bigger? Probably not 10%. Probably they would not be arguing about 10%. So probably it's substantially bigger. How much bigger? I don't know. Number three, uh, I don't know that case as well as I know YPF. So I probably will be reluctant to provide very strong opinions about the magnitude. I uh, agree with everything you said. But, you know, as you said, if the settlement was, if Burford invested 140 million and it was a, choose a number 200 million settlement and Burford rejected it, it's probably because they think there's three or 400 million at the end of the rainbow, maybe more like, it, I, you know, people, people view YPF as a one-off and rightfully so, right? You're probably never getting into another YPF like thing. But to me, one of the things people miss is YPF is such a business confirmation that there are, th this is a VC style thing and there are going to be other big wins in there. And you think about the portfolio they've accrued, you know, this moves actually nicely into book value, you know, tangible book value of the, of Burford right now is what it's about $5 per share. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and it, so 540, excluding the YPF, right? So I exclude YPF. It's about 540 for share. Obviously, there's an asset management business here, but you really want to think about they're increasingly just investing their balance sheet. So you have to look at it as a balance sheet style. But the question is, they're investing their balance sheet at 20, 30 percent in investments. Like how much can they reinvest? How long can they continue to do that? How do you look at valuing the core business here? Okay, so I apologize. Before we get into that question about core valuation, there are two points that I think are important to make about recent results that I think people confused. So number mm -hmm. one, let's start with asset management. All of a sudden, asset management had very bad top headline revenue number in second quarter. And the question like, wait a second, like, what happened? You had some realizations in your business. There was this thing, like, what's happening? So, and I think what's happening is this. It's a very substantial part of the earnings, of revenue, let's start with revenue, of asset management business come from sovereign wealth fund arrangement, BOFC. Because BOF, I believe, is in European structure, so you cannot mark it up. It's only when there is a, a final yep, realization. That's correct, yep. You only so really kind of day to day when you mark cases up or down, blah blah blah. It's only BOFC, sovereign wealth fund. And I think that in most cases, there may be some weird exceptions, but pretty much all the time, the mark of the case should be the same on Burford's own book and in the fund which they manage. Because otherwise, it will be a very awkward conversation with the auditor. Why he it's $100 and he it's 70 right? So it's kind of the same mark, should be. In, but there may be some weird exceptions, but generally, it is the case, I believe. And it means that they most likely Burford also marked a bunch of cases down that BOFC invested. And before they were presumably accruing some future incentive gains based on markup of cases. And now they had market down. So that's what I think probably happened. And that's what I think created very low number in asset management revenue when you look at it. Again, this is my this is my analysis. I Impossible to know for sure, but I think that's the dynamic. And then the second question that I've kind of seen a lot come up is OPEX was quite substantial in the second quarter, based on the, the, the way it was reported. And people, because of that, started worrying. In my case, the worries are not very well founded, that Burford may create a lot of value, but it may not be captured by shareholders. Mm -hmm. it, may, it may be captured by employees. So let's first start with small picture, which is second quarter, and then we can talk about big picture, which is culture, incentives, etc. So on the small picture, there was some, in my opinion, true one-offs, which is three and a half million roughly went into new valuation methodology and establishing infrastructure for quarterly reporting. Some of that I think will not be recurring. Some of that may be a little bit recurring because you need to provide, you need to do quarterly reports going forward and maybe a little bit more expensive for, to do it from accounting perspective. Just to add, like, look, they recast results, I think, eight quarters back for this, right? Obviously, in Q2, they were finalizing, they were talking to the SEC nonstop. Like, you're incurring overtime and you're incurring recast. Is there ongoing SEC compliance costs? Yes, absolutely. But you don't have to recast eight quarters ago every quarter going forward. You've already got it recast. You don't have to pay overtime to establish the framework going forward. You've already got the framework. So yeah, 100% yeah. agree. We're on the same page here. Then there was another $6 million that was paid as a compensation for legacy asset recovery business case. And remember, a number of years ago, Burford bought asset recovery business. I believe it was called Focus. And uh, there were presumably some, based on what we know, there were some cases that they were pursuing. And I guess they structured the deal. It was kind of contingent value rights, in a way, in pharma deals. Instead of you and me arguing how much this highly promising drug that has all the risks of being approved, instead of arguing, let's agree on the payout based on contingency. I think it was something done here as well. And one of those cases, I guess, played out, which is you know, good for everybody involved. And that triggered additional $6 million payment Yep. to the former owners and maybe employees of that group. So again, that is one off. And obviously they pay off on that on those cases that already hunted and got on their platform and started pursuing will be higher than on normal cases that would yep. get. So that's another, which I've used one off. Then on the call, CFO Jordan talked about how the bonuses may be looking high, but there is a true up at the end of the year, et cetera. Yep. We don't know all the numbers, obviously, for the future, but I think where CFO was leading to is that you should not be looking at the bonuses accrued as one line item 
on one single quarter, multiply by four and say this is run rate. There is a lot more movements. And that's what I think he was referring to when he was talking about true up at the end of the year. Yep. So we need to see at the end of the year how it will be true up. Maybe I'm wrong and it will be like, you thought it was high back then? No, at that time it was low. Who knows? But I think it will be, we need to see. We need to get more data. And then there is a final piece that I think uh, Chris Bogart on the call spoke about, which is the following. He said, we give shares to, I believe Burfer gives shares to almost every single employee in the company. Yep. And the way they do it, they buy them in the open market instead of issuing, which I appreciate as a shareholder, and give it to the employees. So, but when they buy, they bought some time ago, I'm making this up, at seven. And now they hire a new person who is great. They give him a share. Now it's 15. And they need to expand it at a higher price, which makes sense. But C but CEO, I believe, was saying like, hey, but we don't get any credit for buying it. Effectively, they did this kind of mini buyback and issuance. So we're not getting, we're not recognizing any gain. So those are all the pieces. And one last piece I would say, and this is more important in my opinion than all this tactical minutia, is this. You hire people and spend money to originate cases today, and they bring you cash based on their maturities in two years and change. But some cases, as we know, run a lot longer, look at the YPF. So I think it's important to keep in mind. And now going to the bigger picture, which I've heard some people, I was honestly surprised when some people brought it up, like, oh, how do we know that uh, management and employees will not capture all the value being created? So my pushback on that is the following. Number one, we do not have any evidence or behavior where Burford employees and top management benefited at the expense of shareholders by mm -hmm. extracting and reasonable compensation. We just do not see that pattern of behavior. And I am relying here that prior behavior is likely to be a good predictor of a future behavior until proven otherwise. If it changes, I will change my mind. I will get on your podcast or maybe not. And we'll say I was wrong. Right? Well, the fourth behavior. podcast, yep. So, so that's point number one. Point number two, if you look at the annual compensation of Chris Bogart and Jonathan Mollett as two key leaders of Burford, it's running, and correct me, there are different components, but call it five, six, seven million dollars a year. And each of them owns roughly 4.5% of Wolf and Chase outstanding. 220 million, I guess, 4.5% of that. Do the mass, multiply by 16. We're talking about the difference between the annual comp and their shareholdings of 20, 25, 30 times. You know, these, and one thing that struck me on the call, I mean, I don't know what the individual shareholders, what the individual employees own, but one thing that Burford has said and that struck me in calls when I was doing with formers was, Everyone does own stock here. And look, if you own stock in Burford and you own 100 shares, like, yes, I'm sure the 1600 this $1,600 that you own as an employee, you know, I'm sure you want it to go up. But if you're a lawyer getting paid $400,000 a year, doesn't matter much. But, you know, I, I do think there is something to, they pay everyone in shares. Employees have a long-term shareholder mindset. Shareholder, they own shares throughout the company. I do think there is a little bit of something to that. So I'm just kind of guessing on that. But yeah. Yes, I think we're on the same page there. I generally like the cool. companies where almost everybody or everybody, I said almost well, everybody was yeah. commenting because what if there is someone who actually doesn't, right? But in my opinion, it's, as far as I know, it's all the employees. I just put that caveat to be safe. It, it's one, it's a post I'm working on, uh, you know, the longer I do this, like Charlie Munger said, I think I'm in the top 1% of thinking incentives are powerful. And I'm always surprised by how powerful incentives are. And it's just one thing, you know, I work with these company, companies all the time. And I sometimes I think they're incompetent, but a lot of times they don't think they're incompetent. They just don't own shares. And like, if you don't own shares and you get paid 500,000 a year and you could sell the whole company for a huge premium and say, you, you're just incentivized to say, hey, the sale will be there next year, but let me see if I can create a little more value and, you know, capture another 500,000 shares and maybe about $500,000 and maybe get a little more shares. And then I can see and see you saw it. And like, I just love having ownership throughout the company, especially at the top, because then, yes, there's always that conflict, but ultimately they're they're rewarded for doing what's going to put money in you and I's pocket. And that's create shareholder value. Okay. Anyway, that's a ramble. Let, let's just real quick. Uh, Burford, if you exclude YPF, the book value here is, where's my number? Okay, if you exclude YPF, the book value here is $4. $4.20 is the right number. If you are only looking at tangible book, it's $3.60. Now, there are a lot of issues with that number, right? A, as you said, they've made investments today that won't pay off, but they've got the expenses today. B, they've been investing for years at 20, 30% plus IRRs. So, you know, that book value should compound very, very nicely. 
uh, all that type of stuff. So, and there's the asset management business, which is on the books for basically nothing, but which generates very high margin income. How do you look at the core business XYPF valuation? So conceptually, I'm looking at the same way as when we did our first podcast in July 2021, quite frankly. So there is not that much change conceptually. So what I did back then, I still do now. I take the all the assets and I subtract those that are not producing financial outcomes today. For example, I will take YPF because I value it completely separately. Yep, yep. We take the entire mark for YPF. And fortunately, Burford discloses that mark, so it's easy to do. I will take goodwill out. You cannot invest goodwill in cases in financial, tangible way. And then usually I would also take some cash cushion out, saying Burford will just, knowing that deployments, drawdowns are somewhat unpredictable, even though they have good models, and they, this is the management team that I believe like to be conservative on those matters. We will keep certain amount of dry powder no matter what on the balance sheet. So I take that out and say, okay, that leaves me with assets that could be producing financial outcomes for new cases. I take that m- m- number and then I apply the, the IRR of 24%. Again, Burford says that IRR is about 29%. Uh, Got to take uh, yeah. expenses out, get overhead, all that sort of stuff, yeah. No, 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 no. That, that's separate. That's separate analysis. So, and then what we, the last number that we've heard publicly was that excluding YPM, but it was quite some time ago, it's 24%. So I take that number and say, okay, this is the gains that should be producing in some normalized way. And that normalized year will never happen. All years will be the better or worse. But that's hypothetical you know, in law, there is this concept of a reasonable man and nobody ever seen that person. So it's kind of the same normalized year. And this is the gains. And then I say, okay, in order to produce those gains, they need certain level of operating expenses, GNA, compensation, public company costs, et cetera, et cetera. I subtract that. And recently I obviously upda- updated that number given the new data points that we got. I took some of the adjustments out that you and I already talked about. That leads me to their pre-operating uh, income. And then you take out their finance costs. And then you got to pre-tax income. You apply some tax rate. You can use mid-teens if you like. This is what they said publicly. That's where they will be approaching. You can take some low number based on the current trends. It's up to you. And that's how I get to normalize that income. And then what I do, and this is important. I take that normalized income. Sorry. Like, this is like one block of analysis I do. And then there's another block analysis you can do, which is, you do you take their earnings for the lot for this I, I like more half than second quarter alone i take their first half year earnings i make some normalization adjustments and then i calculate normalized equity meaning i will take goodwill out i will take ytf out and also when i do the earnings in the second in the first half 2023 i will subtract any markups of ytf because I want to value it completely separately. And then I am getting to my normalized earnings in the first half to nor- and normalized equity in the second half. And I compare the two. So, and based on my math, which has a number of adjustments and reasonable people may argue with some of my adjustments. And by the way, some people I think will argue that I am too conservative. Some people may say you're a little bit too lenient here. And I'm getting to normalized ROE based on the first half to roughly 15.5%. 15.5. So again, uh, I can see how it can be increased if you make some more adjustments. I can see how it can decrease if you want to be very, very prudent. It, so my- just to throw in, I did not do anywhere near the amount of adjustments you do, but in my head, I run this as a high teens ROE business on the assumption that I probably would do something similar to what you did, but on the assumption that some of the expenses they're doing now are for future growth. So mm-hmm. you kind of add them back. So I've kind of always thought this is a high teens ROE business. And one thing we haven't talked about is we didn't give them any, or as far as I know, you didn't give them any credit for the asset management side there. I, I don't give them credit there. I give that separate, but just throwing that out as well. Yes. So in a way, if you want to value asset management separately, which you could, and I've done that as well in the past, you will need to make more adjustments to your normalized earnings. And you will be just taken down from bull for like only own balance sheet business as opposed to asset management, right? So you can either do either way is fine. 
yep. as long as they're consistent. So, and I'm getting, and also I'm not giving them any credit for this future expenses, meaning we yep. spend money today to get something two or three years from now. I, like I'm not doing them any credit for that. And this is what I alluded to when I said some reasonable people, sounds like you will be one of them who will say like, no, you're too punitive. Like you're too conservative here. This X dollars went to create something two years from now. Right now there is no payoff. You need to adjust for that. If you do that, we'll be in high teens, maybe even 20. So, and I think 20% ROE probably achievable for this business. Again, on this normalized basis. Uh, we know that on Q1 2023, Jonathan Moller talked about that they want to run the business at 20% ROE. They, I believe they also said that they started thinking more. They started educating the team more and more, not only about IRR and ROIC, but also how it impacts ROE and profits. So I think based on the management uh, comments on the calls, I believe there is more movement yeah. to focus on those metrics. The one thing I would add there is this business, you could run it more levered. And they, they run lever, and they've talked a couple of times about, hey, we've got all this leverage capacity. We've got, got all this liquidity. I don't think you want to, but... You know, we, you and I have been seeing ROEs in the high teens, low 20s, mid teens, whatever. If they wanted to, they could probably take the ROE to 35, 40%. They could just juice it by really levering it up. Or again, they could sell cases off to third parties and kind of go with the two and 20 model. So we've been doing the ROE. I think that that's right. But there are ways you could get higher ROEs. You know, the ROE is just a number. It's the output of a bunch of different inputs. I, I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm just throwing it out there. No, no, no. It's a, it's a very, very valid comments. What you're saying is that, yeah, sure, they're high teens, maybe 20, but... 20 meaning goal approaching, but with a different cap structure, they could achieve a lot, a lot more. I agree with it. It's one pushback a lot of people have had, both investors and non-investors. Why don't they buy back shares? Like they, they could just go buy back shares. And their point is, hey, we can invest at great returns into these cases. And I've kind of pushed them and said, hey, you could do both, right? You, you could take out a little more debt, but yeah. Uh, number one, I wish they, they did trade buyback, especially like six months ago or in, during COVID or after COVID or March or February of this year. Like I wish they did. So that's number one. Number two, I understand, I think, where management is coming from. And this is not just an opportunity to invest capital at very high IRR and ROIC. I think it's also making sure that you have enough capital. If a big corporate client comes to you, which kind of happened last reported quarter when they announced Cisco. 25 million. Well, well, Cisco is one, a good example, but also in the second quarter, they announced another portfolio deal for 325 million with Fortune 50 company. That's a lot of money. Most, most litigation hedge funds have less than that in the entire fund. I don't have that in my fund, I'll tell you that. You don't, you don't want, I think, what management doesn't want to be in a position when someone comes and says, Burford, we got this great portfolio of cases. Look at it. It's it's pure beauty, pure magic. We need 325 million. And Burford says, like, we don't have it. I, I think that's what they want to prevent. And I think the management team t tends to be conservative on these matters, which I understand. And that's one of the reasons why they have not done buyback. And I believe Chris Bogart on one of the calls back in 2020 during COVID time said when he was like, why don't Pashpo do buybacks? He said, we don't want to turn a client because we spend cash on the buyback. So I think that's the tension. What I wish Burford did, and candidly, I'm surprised that they haven't done it yet, is having a revolver with, uh, you know, I don't know, name a bank, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Chase, that's, whatever. Exactly. Because you, with the buybacks, it's not like we're asking them to go crazy into debt to buy back stock. It's like a consistent buyback program as long as you're, like, as you said, if they had bought any point before the past two weeks at all this year, they would have been buying for less than I think you and I think they'll get in the proceeds from YPF. So they kind of would have been buying the core business free. And yeah, I want them to go do this 325 million deal, but you could just take out a revolver, you know, 25 million a quarter as the proceeds, as the business, eventually the growth will slow and you'll, you know, get the, the fruits of this year's investment. As you get the fruits of this year's investment, pay down the revolver or keep it constant, ramp it up. If that 325 million deal comes in and says, say, Hey, we're not going to buy back shares for the next half of a year so that we can pay this investment down. But yeah, I wish they did that. Just to clarify, when I said I don't have that in my fund, I obviously meant my personal funds. I cannot afford the litigation expense. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? 
According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. So let, let's just, we've, we're approaching the two hour podcast. I think this is the longest podcast we've done. We've talked a lot about it. So we mentioned high teens, mid teens, are we on the core business? What do you think that comes out to you like on a kind of per share basis? Oh boy, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to throw the uh, numbers out because what was likely to happen this normalized year will never happen. And I would look either as someone who put too high of a number and it doesn't happen for the next year, or they have some blockbuster second half 2023 and it would be look like, dude, you're so I low. I, I didn't mean in terms of a normalized EPS. I just meant like in terms of how you, on a per share basis, how you value the core business. Look, so in, in my opinion, given that we're talking about the business that should be having high teens, maybe even 20 ROE, I think it should be trading at a multiple of book value if you want to appro approach that methodology. And I think it probably should be anyway between, if I want to be conservative, I will say 2x. If I want to be a little bit more optimistic and aggressive, I will say 35 half 4x. So that's yep. what one point. Okay. the point, in my opinion, is that this type of business should be trading on a, a substantial PE. I call it at least market PE. I think it's not unreasonable. Why? I always believed that Burford, if we fast forward five or 10 years and we're doing another podcast, hopefully we're doing it from your yacht called Burford. I think it would be called Eden Park. I like the Eden Park name for a yacht, but yeah, there you go. Okay, I will, I will take Peterson for my yacht if I buy one with Burford uh, investment. So in any event, uh, jokes aside, I hope that this business will become, and is it's in the process of becoming already, it will be a Blackstone of litigation finance. Yep. That's what I said at the very, very beginning. That was my thesis. There were ups and downs along the way. So, but I think we're marching there. Burford has roughly a scale of 3x of the second competitor. I think it's a big scale in an industry where scale matters. 325 million portfolio deal that they announced is a good in evidence for that. I've loved the book by Steve Schwartzman, What It Takes, an autobiography. And I think he makes a number of interesting examples how Blackstone being the biggest and having the most scale allowed them to do certain deals that no, almost nobody could even try. And is, that the one, is that the one where he claims he has a 48-inch vertical? I don't remember that. I, I think that's the one where he claims he has a 48-inch vertical, which would put him like, you know, in NBA athlete levels. And he's like a, a five foot, or he said he did. Uh, but I, I only mentioned that. I agree with you. He gives all the benefits of scale. I shouldn't have cut you off. But yeah. I, I just always think about, oh, man, this guy, he's really uh, – He's really believing the hype if he's if he put in writing that he had a 48 inch, inch vertical and thought nobody would call him out as hey man you you would have been in the Olympics with this with that type of thing that, that don't know uh, but I did enjoy the book that's what I that's what I can say and while I was reading the book I was thinking a lot understandably about parallels between Steve Schwarzman and Blackstone story and Burford story and uh, look again you and I spoke about this earlier. 14 years ago, they launched a small fund IPO in London because for whatever reason, London investors after financial crisis were more perceptive to invest in something like this. And now you and I are speculating that they may be having conference calls or face-to-face -face meetings with IMF officials. You know, I just... That's a big step up. I When I wake up on the right side of the bed, I guess the two things I would add to is one, if you go back to, it's starting to come back, but if you go back to before Silicon Valley Bank failed, if you had a bank that did a 20% ROE, they would be valued at three to four times book would probably be about where they're valued. And, you know, people might hear Burford, if you exclude the YPF claims has never been valued, it may be before the Muddy Waters at the three to four times book, but look, they've got the point of 
YPF proved they can have huge wins in here. And even when you exclude it, they can do 15 to 20% ROE. I don't think based on that 3X book is crazy. That's point number one. And then point number two, when I wake up on the right side of the bed, I love the comparison you made to Blackstone because when I wake up on the right side of the bed, I say, look, you know, 15 years ago, people would have said, oh, KKR, Blackstone, all these guys, they're long into two PE funds. But it, scale matters here. And Burford is an N of one in terms of there's there are other publicly traded litigation firms, but no one with their size, no one with their scale. But this is all the, kind of the only one that's investable institutional level. Nobody knows how to value them today. But 10 years from now, like they won't even have YPF on their balance sheet 10 years from now, but they will still almost certainly be the largest litigation player. And I think if you go back and you look at, hey, you could have invested in one of these private equity guys when they first went public and everybody like didn't really know how to value them and look at them, you would have done quite well. And I think that's going to be the answer for Burford in 10 years from now. And that's why, you know, if you can do a 20% ROE, three times book, two and a half times book, it's not crazy. And, you know, not only is it not crazy, it compounds really, really nicely. So- all right, we're approaching the two hour mark. We've covered a lot. I think people can get an idea of fair value based on everything that we've laid out. We don't have to sell it out specifically, but anything else you would add to our discussion on Burford today? Probably not. After two hours, it's difficult to add, quite frankly, uh, th th that much more. Well, look, I, I, Artem, you, I called you the king of Burford on Twitter. You've done incredible work. I thank you because uh, in large part, based on the stuff, I've been a multi-year Burford as you said earlier, investor throughout all the Burford complex because of this. And it's been uh, a rewarding experience, both so far financially, but also just following it, doing the work on it has been really fun. And uh, I know you and I know several other sharp investors who are invested in Burford and we've met some of them through it. So Burf Artem, this has been great. I'm looking forward to pod five. Maybe it'll be the fourth on Burford. I know you've got a few other ones, but uh, this has been great. We'll wrap it up here and look, I'll, I'll include a link uh, to all of Artem's previous appearances, everything in the show notes, if you want to follow up on that. So we can go from there. Thank you. Good, man. Thank you. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.